Okay, thank you again for joining us this morning for Sunday worship. Uh, my name is Moses. I am the church planning pastor of our church. And um, I'm happy to announce that it's that time of the year again. Every year we spend a few weeks on the topic of faith and work. And if you remember from last year, which uh, many of you may not, but it's okay. Uh, it, it, there's a statistic, or rather, um, a sub not a statistic, but a set of numbers that I thought was helpful for thinking about why this theme is so important that we should probably even revisit this every year. Um, it's pretty wild to think about it because most of us spend about 8 to 10 hours a day working slash commuting, uh, 5 days a week, and if we sleep 7 hours a day, that means we spend less than 7 to 9 hours at home with our families, and even less with our children if they sleep before us. That means that for the majority of the week, we spend more time at work, doing work, going to work, or thinking about work more than anything else in our lives. If this was anything else in our lives, we would call that idolatry. <laughs> but as we navigate this sinful and broken world and the, and the natural result or the um, consequences of, of toiling and laboring in this uh, sinful world, we obviously don't necessarily consider it idolatry by default, but it is the nature of the world we live in right now. Therefore, it shouldn't surprise us then that almost all the research out there says that employment makes a significant contribution to our well-being, and it's not just because we're getting paid. All right, Just by the fact that we are employed makes a significant contribution to our well-being physically and emotionally. Employment oftentimes provides purpose and meaning. And on the flip side, the pain caused by the experience of unemployment is one of the best documented findings in all research concerning happiness and, and longevity, etc. And yet one recent study found that the same pain that we feel from unemployment essentially disappears when a person finds a new job. I mean, clearly, work then is really good for us, or it's an idol that we turn to like a drug to get a daily fix in order to feel better about our perhaps meaningless and empty lives. Or maybe it's a little bit of both, or maybe it's neither. Regardless, it's clear that based on scripture, based on how we pattern our lives, based on our society, even based on our, the research that's out there, work is very powerful and influential to our um, well-being. Today, we're going to look at the, the story of Exodus and what the Israelites did right after they were liberated from slavery and entered the wilderness as they journeyed to the promised land. And we'll see two different stories of how they worshipped either idols or the God of their ancestors. And, and how in their worship, they used their, the skills that they acquired from their time in enslavement in Egypt for either, again, worshipping idols or worshipping the one true God. And how these two separate stories apply to us today. So I have three points for today's message as they continue to... Uh, fix the sound. The first point is work as idolatry. The second point is work as communal worship. And the third is work as discipleship. First point, work as idolatry from Exodus chapter 32, starting from verse 1. Now, when the people, the Israelites, saw how long it was taking Moses to come down from the mountain or Mount Sinai, where Moses was, was getting the uh, Ten Commandments, Oh, I'm blocking it. Sorry. Okay. They gathered around Aaron, the brother of Moses, and said, Come, or come on, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. And so Aaron said, 
take the gold, in, gold, uh, gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. And all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. The people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. And after this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. The Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly have they turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down um, gold and made a calf and have, they, have, uh, they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, in this famous story from the book of Exodus that many of us are probably familiar with, the prophet Moses was at Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from God, and because he took so long, the newly liberated Israelites began to have doubts. And their fears and uncertainty, or uncertainty started really striking at their hearts. I mean, questions about, did God leave them? Did God forget about them? Uh, was Moses killed by wild animals? And if he was, what does that say about the supposed power of the God of their ancestors that were supposed to protect them? Whatever the case, they create uh, the famous golden calf, an idol to represent the divine power that brought them out of Egypt. They even give it the name Yahweh. In verse 5, but at what point is this not now... Yahweh, the God of their ancestors, the covenant God of their family, and an idol, and now having become an idol. We don't know, but the point is that God himself sees this as being idolatry. And so we say this is idolatry, and even though it is associated with the name of the God of their covenant, it's no longer that God. But as we learned in the book of Judges, idols... The idols that we worship usually reflect the deepest fears or desires of our hearts. And the idols themselves demand our love, loyalty, and service. So, then that begs the question, why did they make a calf? Why didn't they make an eagle? Why didn't they make a snake? Why didn't they worship a frog? Why a calf? This actually is a very easy question to answer if you study... Um, the ancient Near Eastern cultures. Calf idols in that region during that time represented fertility and strength. So if you worship a statue of a calf, you might call it many different names. In that region, it was Baal. But when you worship the calf, you usually wanted wealth, power, and a lot of kids. All things that the Israelites were low on and were fearful of not having because they were a nomadic people now living, literally wandering through a desert wilderness. And so in their precarious situation in the desert wilderness, they worshipped and ultimately desired security and stability. They worshipped and ultimately desired security and stability. And in their cultural expression, it took the form of a calf. And when you think about it, in one sense, who could blame them? I mean, you were just liberated from being a slave for your entire life. And now you are living and wandering through the desert wilderness. Of course, it's natural to be a little fearful and insecure and, and wanting some stability in your life. But they turn to the wrong deity for those things. This particular uh, uh, betrayal by the Israelites is almost like sleeping with a prostitute on the first night of your honeymoon. It wasn't a good look. And it certainly did not communicate loyalty and love to the God of their covenant. And the creation of this, staff, of this calf, in one sense, was also a, a workplace rebellion. Now, having been ex uh, liberated from the exploitative work by their Egyptian employers, they're now setting up their own shop in defiance against the God who saved them. 
who hired them for a different purpose, uh, the construction and the building of a new home, a new kingdom in the promised land. Rather, they invest their wealth, their retirement funds, literally marked by the gold earrings that were supposed to be heirlooms passed down to the next generation because that were, those are the only ways that they could carry their wealth with them. I mean, it's not like you could haul a chest full of gold through the desert wilderness because if it's all located in one place, what if desert raiders just steal that, right? So people put it on their bodies. It was easier to carry around. They invest all of these things, they sacrifice and collaborate, craftsmen of various skills are involved in the work. And remember, when the Israelites first came to the land of Egypt, they were all shepherds. They weren't, um, they weren't blacksmiths. They weren't metal workers. They weren't um, woodworkers. They were shepherds. All of these skills they acquired from their previous employer. And they utilize this training, and the creativity that is inherent to all beings made in the image of God, all for the sake of security and stability. Now, in many ways, those of us like the Israelites who grew up in unstable homes would do anything for stability once we have the financial means to obtain it. I want to acknowledge that because I know for many of us who grew up in unstable homes, whether they were broken for different reasons or because you immigrated here as a family, uh, your parents immigrated here with very little in their pockets. I get it. Once you have the financial means to obtain stability, it's usually the first thing that we want. Because the last thing we want for our kids is the dangers of instability that we grew up with when we were their age. I remember having this conversation with my next door neighbor, uh, where uh, in our backyard, as many of you know, we built uh, we we uh, we built this um, kind of like uh, prepackaged playground in our backyard. For, the, for our kids and the church kids when they come over to play on. And I remember having this conversation with my neighbor where I said, when I was growing up, I grew up in a mostly uh, Hispanic neighborhood uh, in an apartment complex where we had to share the, the playground with all the kids in the neighborhood. And because I was only in the first grade when we first moved, if the older kids wanted to use, let's say, the swing that I was on and I wasn't done using it, they would just beat me up to get use of the swing. And that's how I grew up in the playground. Use, uh, that's how I associated playgrounds growing up. That when the bigger, older kids came, you move out of the way or you get beat up. But here's my kid, the next generation. He doesn't ever have to worry about any of that. He just wakes up, gets permission from his parents to go outside and goes on the swing by himself. No threat, uh, no danger. No bullies, no wild animals that are after him. And so, in many ways, I get why those of us who grew up in these unstable or, or, or situations where we lack security, that we would want those things for our kids. It's traumatizing, and we don't want that to be passed down. And so, for those of us who grew up poor, living, uh, living closer to work, maybe in upscale, gentrified urban neighborhoods, or in the safety of suburbia, I mean, it makes sense why we would want to move in those neighborhoods where we can find security and comfort for us and our families. But I want to challenge you all and make us reflect on this. How much of this impulse is us Pursuing, to some degree or another, security and comfort, or security and stability, as an idol. A modern version of the golden calf. I feel like, based on my conversations with many of us, that the neighborhoods that we choose to live in because of the comfort, stability, and security that it offers, I, I feel like for many of us in our church, 
that we that you all feel a tinge of guilt. Because from the conversations that I have, you all have a, a, a very big heart for the poor, for immigrants and refugees. But the neighborhood, neighborhoods that we choose to live in don't necessarily reflect that. And so because of this contradiction, many of us, I, I feel like uh, I sense a tinge of guilt or responsibility that our living situation isn't ideal and it doesn't reflect our values. It doesn't conform neatly to our values of loving the poor, befriending them, being literally their neighbors and sharing the gospel with them. So what do we do? We might look for a church that challenges these idols and, and provides opportunities to do something about it locally, and we might end up giving or doing just enough to satisfy our guilty consciences. But then we might wonder, why is it so hard to love my coworkers when power dynamics are at play? We might wonder, how do I befriend a co-worker who, who, who shares values different from my own? Or how can I get the training and experience to intentionally share the gospel with my co-worker? I want us to consider this. Could it be that not being a good church neighbor is making you miss out on discipleship opportunities to become a better workplace neighbor? Could it be that not being a good church neighbor is making you miss out on discipleship opportunities to becoming a better church, a better workplace neighbor? When we neglect missional opportunities through serving with the church because of our pursuit of security and comfort, where we are ultimately turning, uh, 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 where we are, where are, where, uh, I'm sorry, are we ultimately turning to uh, for our Security and comfort. Okay, let me rephrase it. Let me reread that again. When we neglect missional opportunities through serving with the church because of our pursuit of security and comfort, where are we ultimately turning to for our security and comfort? There we go. In other words, have we made a golden calf in our hearts? And as a result, have we missed out on the formation that comes, the spiritual formation that comes from properly Worshiping the Lord. You know, one fascinating recent research revealed that blue collar Christian workers are generally better at integrating faith into their work. They're less shy about sharing the gospel, inviting their co workers out to church, and so on. And even as the vast majority of the faith and work stuff, material curriculum, conferences that are out there are tailored to white-collar workers, these workers have still have a more difficult time integrating their faith into their workplace. Why do you think that might be the case? In what ways have we made our work into idol worship? In what ways have we allowed the liturgies of high-paying, more entitled work to shape our hearts so that our worship of God is skewed, deformed, to the point that it's not even biblically recognizable? And then we wonder, why is it so hard to be a missionary in the workplace? Second point, work as communal worship. Now we're going to turn to Exodus 35. And in Exodus 35, God gives a different command. Come all of you who are gifted craftsmen. Construct everything that the Lord has commanded. So the whole community of Israel left Moses and returned to their tents. All whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle, for the performance of its rituals, and for the sacred garments. Both men and women came, all whose hearts were willing. They brought to the Lord their offerings of gold, brooches, I don't know what brooches are, earrings, rings from their fingers, and necklaces. They, present, uh, they presented gold objects of every kind as a special offering to the Lord. All those who owned the 
following items willingly brought them. Blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Fine linen and goat hair for cloth. Again, that's supposed to be nice back then. So don't assume that's not something nice. Goat hair. Ram skins and fine goatskin leather. And all who had silver and bronze objects gave them as a sacred offering to the Lord. And all who had acacia wood brought it for use in the project, all the men who were, all the women who were skilled in sewing and spinning, prepared blue and purple and scarlet thread and fine linen cloth. All the women who were used, who were willing, uh, who were willing, used their skill to spin the goat hair into yarn. The leaders brought onyx stones and special and the special gemstones to be set in the ephod and the priest's chest piece. They also brought spices and olive oil for the light, the anointing oil, and this fragrant incense. So the people of Israel, every man and woman who were eager, eager to help in the work the Lord had given them through Moses, brought their gifts and gave them freely to the Lord. Now in any marriage, if your spouse found out that you slept with a prostitute on the first night of your honeymoon, your marriage would pretty much be over. But in an act of radical and outrageous grace, God forgives his people for betraying him through worshiping a golden calf, and he essentially rehires them, and this time he commissions them to build a tabernacle, which is a, a, a beautiful, uh, transportable, uh, mobile tent, or temple, and home for God's spirit as he dwelt with his people while they were still traveling to the promised land. The tent itself had allusions to the Garden of Eden, offering the community, this community of workers a glimpse into God's new creation in the midst of a broken world, a glimpse into how God will gather his people and use their skills, workplace skills, to create a new society, a new world. It was a huge honor for the Israelites. It was also a communal effort, men and women, both. It says freely, not under compulsion, but freely contributed to this work. Notice their attention to the smallest details. They believe that God cared about even the very little things that they were working on that day. Their work was literally worship. But it's not just with the construction of this tent that's important, because if you read the rest of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, in many ways, uh, it, it, it's like a, a blueprint for how workers come together to conduct themselves in worship and in communal living. There are complex details for, uh, for offering uh, instructions, for how to make sacrifices, for festival celebrations, for how to be generous to the orphan, widow, and the refugee with your work. And it's in these details we see how the Israelites were able to connect their daily labor in farming and shepherding and, and, and metalworking, etc., with worshiping God through obedience to his word. They offered their best animals, their first fruits, and not their leftovers or what little they had left after a long day of work as an offering to be used for God's kingdom. And they did it with joy because all of their work culminated in full obedience to God's word for the construction and perpetuation of his kingdom for his glory. And they were glad to participate in that honor. Their work was worship and their work culminated in further, greater worship. Notice, too, that the skills that the men and women, uh, that the, the, the skills that they brought with them from Egypt, again, were most likely acquired and honed in during their time as slaves. Probably for the construction and adornment of temples to false gods. But these skills are now redeemed and repurposed for good work. 
freely done, and again, not under compulsion for the glory of God. Now, when I was in high school, um, I had a friend named Patrick that my friends and I used to go for uh, buying illegal substances. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, and after I repented from my short-lived season of rebellion, uh, I started bringing him out to church. I even tried to share the gospel with him once or twice. And I remember one, uh, one specific time, he actually thanked me for sharing the gospel with him. And he actually, he said that he appreciated why I was doing it. Because, I, 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 because in many ways, I think he also realized he wanted to change his life around, but he didn't know how. But he still said thank you for that. But he said it, wasn't, it just wasn't for him, that he wasn't ready yet. And after we graduated, I eventually lost uh, touch with him. But uh, during our senior year was when uh, I think it was the second year Facebook was ever uh, came out. And so everybody kind of heard about Facebook. And we all were supposed to like make an account so we could all like friend our friends um, and all that. And um, yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> and um, we stayed in, uh, we friended each other on Facebook, but that was it. We never uh, really talked. And then seven years later, well, when I was in seminary, he Facebook messaged me, and he wished me a happy birthday, and he asked if we could meet up for coffee sometime. And I remember being so happy uh, that he reached out because it had been so long, but also uh, because I thought, you know, maybe he might be open to coming out to church now. I don't know. And so, um, uh, and on top of that, I thought it was a little strange that um, my former drug dealer wanted to meet up for coffee of all things drug dealers don't drink coffee so okay um so we decided to meet at a korean bakery uh, behind arby's on route 40 in Ellicott city if you know where that is uh they have the best uh the twist bread there in my opinion on route 40 and so i wanted to meet there and uh, we walked in and I, I walked in and there was the same patrick i knew from high school sitting and waiting for me uh he had put on about 20 pounds or so, but it was the same Patrick. And I remember just being so excited to see him. We hugged and said hi. Um, and then at the moment we sat down, the first thing he says to me is, Moses, I've actually been wanting to have this meeting with you to thank you. And I said, for what? And he said, for sharing the gospel to me when you did. Because it planted seeds in my heart so that when I heard the gospel again in college from some random dude on campus, I was finally able to repent and believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I, I remember literally tearing up in joy at that moment because the same dude that I was worried might drink himself to death in high school was now my fellow brother in Christ. And so we spent a few moments catching up, you know, what we've been up to. And um, eventually I asked him, so what do you do now? Um, and he said, oh, well, you know, he transferred to UMBC from community college. And, um, and uh, he, stopped, he stopped going to school because uh, he started his own business and he's going to finish his degree later. And I was like, oh, <laughs> what kind of is this? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, remember how I used to sell drugs? I'm like, yeah, well, in all honesty, and he, he says, in all honesty, you know, I think drug dealing gave me the skills to be a good salesman. And I'm like, huh? Like, okay, what? And he said, you know, I learned how to talk to people. I, I, I wasn't shy anymore about approaching people, about selling my product. I, I, and, and I learned how, like, market principles of, like, de uh, supply and demand work. And so, you know, and this was during, like, uh, several years after the Great Recession. And so he said, I started a real estate business to help people with, like, uh, managing their finances and getting out of, like, uh, difficult mortgage situations. And I'm actually really doing really well for myself. Um, and uh, I don't know if you listen to the radio station, but they actually interviewed me and my business partner. And, you know, we're, um, we, we're actually doing really well. And, and, I, and I remember saying, you know, because I, I, I had a hard time believing it. And I, I said, but you drove your mom, you're the same, you know, you drove your mom's Toyota Camry, the same car that you used to drive in high school. I see it right outside. 
And I remember telling him then on the on the looking at the table, and you still have the same Motorola razor from when you were a senior in high school. What do you mean you're doing well for yourself? And he said, and something I will never forget, because it's so humbling. He said, Yeah, because I don't care about all that stuff anymore. I just want to make money and give it all away to missions or something. And I remember feeling so ashamed because I had just saved up all my money to buy the new iPhone <laughs> on that table. And I remember slowly putting my hand on it. Like, <laughs> This was my first uh, real-life lesson in how God can redeem workplace skills acquired from, from either wicked or mundane circumstances and repurpose them for His glory. Friends, you may be asking yourselves, what was the point of me going to school? Whether it was two years or four years, or you went additionally for grad school and you're having a hard time finding employment, or you're not happy with your current employment. It's not fulfilling. Or maybe you might ask, you might be asking, why did I waste so many years at that job? I'm not happy. I don't understand what God is trying to do. What God was trying to do all those years, it just feels like a complete waste. May I challenge you to pray and ask the Lord to use whatever knowledge or skills that you've, that you've acquired over the years for kingdom purposes as your act of worship. Because if God can redeem a drug dealer and his work skills, I promise you, he can redeem your studies and your work skills too. Third, work as discipleship. Um, verse 30, then Moses told the people of Israel the Lord has specifically chosen uh, Bezalel, Bezel, Bezel son of Uri, grandson of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And the Lord has filled Bezalel with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold and silver and... Sorry. And bronze. <laughs> he is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. I want to be like this guy. And the Lord has given both him and Aholiab, son of Ahisamech, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach their skills to others. How useful. And the Lord has given them special skills as engravers, designers, embroiderers in, purple, in blue, purple, and scarlet thread on fine linen and weavers. They excel at craftsmen and as designers. I love how the story ends. Whereas the construction of the golden calf was centralized under the craftsmanship of one man, Moses' brother Aaron, it's a monopoly, essentially. The construction of the tabernacle was communal, collaborative, and even intergenerational. Whereas the construction of the golden calf left the entirety of the Israelites' wealth in the hands of one man, the construction of the tabernacle empowered many men, women, uh, uh, skilled and unskilled, to contribute together, to learn together, to be taught Whereas the construction of the golden calf was motivated by selfish gain and fear of the unknown, the construction of the tabernacle was led by spirit-filled disciple-makers who would disciple others. The result was that families would worship together, rest together, feast together, family and friends rather, and serve together. No one did it on their own. They all came together to work and to worship together. Again, research shows that supportive co-workers and supervisors are crucial for the well-being of workers. Sometimes as much as how much you get paid, if not even more than how much you get paid. In the church, we can learn how to be supportive co-laborers and ministry leaders by serving, fellowshipping, and interacting with one another. And as we hone these, these practical skills in the church, we can use these 
skills in the workplace to bless our co-workers. Maybe the reason why you don't know how to be a blessing to your co-workers is because you don't know how to be a blessing to your fellow co-laborers in the church. You don't know the basic social skills of texting and checking in with another. Of apologizing when you make mistakes. Of, of, of volunteering to take on a heavier load for a certain opportunity to serve. Because you're too busy. Because you're selfish. Or you don't know how to encourage one another in the gospel. And then you wonder why I don't know how to share the gospel with my non-Christian co-workers. They're all connected, folks. To that end, I'm excited to share that our upcoming inner uh, MC inter, uh, intermissional community will, at the end of October, will be an open invite to everyone, members, attendees, and guests. One of our members, Josh Wu, uh, who's sitting there in the back, he uh, did the heavy lifting in helping us gather uh, the crucial data data that we've acquired from uh, the survey that we sent out uh, over a month ago, where our members, where our members are in terms of like. Uh, what industry you work in and, and how long you've been employed if if you have uh, experience in managerial roles and how long how well you're doing and in integrating your faith into your work so we have all this data now and uh, in the coming weeks we'll be in, come to contacting some of you uh uh, and announcing several locations for inter-MC gatherings based on the data we've gathered. We're going to try multiple intersections based on either industry, based on gender, based on uh, managerial experience, all of these things. We're going to try and mix and match all of these mul in, mul through multiple meetings. This is not a networking event. I mean, it can be if you want, but we want it to be more than that. <laughs> We want you to rather, more so than that, be vulnerable with each other, to share what victories and challenges, challenges you, have, uh, yeah, you have or are currently facing. To pray for one another, to stay in touch with each other, to, to ask for just guidance in your industry or in your role. To be willing to share what you know to the folks who are just starting in the workplace. So, stay tuned and uh, respond to any more survey requests that we have in the future because we actually do stuff with that. So, if you didn't fill out this first survey, look out for another one in the future. I'll conclude with this. These two contrasting stories from Exodus, one with the construction of the golden calf and one with the construction of the tabernacle, don't give us all of the answers for how to be faithful in the workplace. But they do invite us to pursue lifelong discipleship in the church first and in the workplace second. Skills and character development in the first can and will translate into the second. At least in the first, we can make mistakes without risking getting fired. We can ask for forgiveness, receive forgiveness, reconcile, and try again when we make mistakes. Furthermore, in both the Old and the New Testaments, God's Word reminds us that His chosen family is a kingdom of priests. It's not just Aaron and these construction workers who are building these things that are responsible for doing these holy acts of work. It is all believers now in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, uh, Peter rather, uh, borrows Old Testament language in 1 Peter 2, verse 5, to describe the church as a holy priesthood. The church is a holy priesthood whose purpose is to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Several verses later, in verse 9, Peter says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is all possible because Jesus is the great high priest, the true king of God's kingdom. Unlike Pharaoh, Jesus rules with justice, righteousness, and love. But not only does he uh, rule, he also intercedes on, on behalf of, of his people, both as a sacrificial lamb and as a true high priest. 
through his sacrifice on the cross, the sacrificial system of the old is fulfilled because Jesus is the final and perfect sacrifice to redeem us. And yet, as a redeemed people of God's family and kingdom, we now have roles to play as members of his family, as priests under the order of Christ and Melchizedek. We all rest in Christ, but we also serve like Christ. But in his, and in his kingdom, the priorities are reversed. Reversed from those what we see in the workplace. Because in his kingdom, the poor are blessed, not the rich. Those who pursue justice are blessed. Not the selfish, not those who are just concerned about quarterly profits. Those who weep and suffer are blessed. Not the entitled or those who are able to acquire more companies and sell them. While letting go of workers. In his kingdom, the last will be first and the first will be last. These are the values that we get discipled into in the church as you try and usher in God's kingdom into the workplace. These are the values that we bring in to be a light and salt as our act of worship into the church, uh, into the workplace. And because the church is a kingdom of priests, we all have priestly duties that we must fulfill. We're not just like mindless workers. Not only must we pursue holy and blameless lives, but we must also bandage the wounded, feed the poor, and empower the weak. To be holy means to be set apart. We are set apart from the world in this way, by doing things differently from the world. Our priority is sacrifice, not consumption. Giving, not extraction. Creation of beauty, not the infusion of chaos, not hate, but forgiveness, not anger, of, not hate, right? Love, not hate, forgiveness, not anger, empathy, not lecturing. These are the ways that we're not only set apart, but these are also the ways that we now offer our lives as spiritual and living sacrifices in the workplace. Therefore, as a kingdom of priests redeemed through the blood of Christ, let us use our, our spiritual privileges to proclaim Christ with our words and also in our deeds with joy and thanksgiving as we incorporate our faith into work. Let's pray.